Welcome back guys to our today's session at Daniel Security Academy. As always, take a seat, sit back and have your favorite drink filled up before jumping into today's lesson. Today we'll peek into the giant topic of cryptography. The following sessions will dive deeper into several aspects of cryptography, while this will be more on a high level one. Um, as always, we need to learn some terms around cryptography first to have the same common understanding of what we are talking about. Um, then we'll go back in time and look at the stars of cryptography, which are probably way older than you might expect. Afterwards, we'll start to look into symmetric and asymmetric encryption systems. Again, rather on a high level, the next sessions will go into more detail about symmetric encryption and the one afterwards will go into more detail about asymmetric encryption. Um, once we made it past the asymmetric systems, we will um, learn more about Kirchhoff's principle. Um, apart from the CIA trade, uh, it's another key concept of IT security. And lastly, we'll have a short summary of the learnings today. Let's jump into the key terms around cryptography. Above cryptography, we have the cryptology, which represents the science aspect behind cryptography. It is the, the science of drafting, applying and analyzing cryptographic methods. Let's say it's the overall term of cryptography. Um, cryptography itself um, is about the um, encryption and decryption of a message. So how can this be done? It is basically the key aspect behind confidentiality. On the other hand, we also have the crypto analysis, which is about how secure is an encryption algorithm really, like the algorithm itself. Um, those experts are the ones looking into every single bit of an algorithm with a strong mathematical background and knowledge. Now, there is one thing we need to distinguish from cryptography. It is steganography, which is trying to hide the existence of an information in general, for example, by embedding a message into an existing medium, such as a picture, for example. Um, cryptography, on the other hand, tries rather to hide the meaning of information. So cryptography does not deny that there is something secret in a text, but the text itself is not supposed to be readable. And both terms, though, have the same overall goal to protect information. Steganography will be covered after we're finished with the cryptography sessions. And it is a very interesting area. I know IT folks don't tend to be very good at being creative, but for a moment you need to imagine being in the great Roman Empire led by Julius Caesar, just like 50 years before Christ. At this time, Julius came up with a possibility to send messages safe even if an enemy would intercept a message. He thought about a system to use a key to shift the alphabet for the messages, so clear text would become a cipher text. If you would encrypt the word hello with a given key of, let's say, three, you would re receive the following plain to cipher and cipher to plain text translations. So an H would become a K because we move the alphabet by three positions. And when we decrypt the K, obviously, uh, we move the alphabet back three positions and receive our H back. Next up, it's the E, which becomes an H. We have L becoming an O, another o, L becoming another O, and finally, the O becoming an R. There is one problem with this. You might already see it. Um, without today's knowledge, we might already see the problem we have with this kind of encryption. 
The frequency of specific letters remain the same, no matter if plain or ciphertext. So a frequency analysis will be able to decrypt the message most likely. Let's do a quick excursion into relative letter frequency to understand the problem we have with monoalphabetic ciphers like Caesar's. As said before, those ciphers have the same frequency of letters in the ciphertext as in the plaintext, with just a fixed shift of positions throughout the alphabet. In English text, the letter E will be still the most often letter, and the longer the text is, the easier it becomes to decrypt the letters based on the relative letter frequency. In the chart on the right hand side, you see the letter frequency of the English alphabet in percentage, demonstrating very strong trends. For example, in texts E occurs 12.7%, T about 9.1%, A just more than 8%, O 7.5%, and I approximately 7%. Those five letters make up to 44.5% of the entire alphabet. In contrast to that, a Z occurs only 0.07%. In other words, a Z occurs approximately once in 1,500 letters. So it took more than 1,600 years until a French diplomat and cryptographer called Blas de Vigenere stepped into the game and came up with a polyalphabetic cipher. Also, polyalphabetic ciphers are using a key to move the alphabet. However, this time the key is not simply a number or a letter, but for example an entire word. Let's check this by using an example again. If we want to encrypt the word hello again, with the key of EUFH results in the following translations. We have an H which is shifted by E positions to the right, um, so it becomes an M. E becomes a V while being moved U steps to the right. The first L becomes a P as it is moved by F positions whereas the second L becomes a T as it is moved H times. Now the key length is exhausted as we only had four letters in a key. Uh, so the key starts from the first letter again, meaning the O is moved again by E positions to become a T. By looking at the ciphertext, you can see that the letter frequency is entirely different and random when using this kind of method. Now let's talk about symmetric and asymmetric systems. We start with symmetric systems as Caesar and Visionaire both are symmetric ciphers. There's only a single key which is used to both encrypt and decrypt the plain and ciphertext. If you have both the ciphertext and the key you can easily decrypt the message. Therefore, the key must be protected. This principle is the most important part of symmetric systems, makes them at the same time more difficult. Symmetric encryption methods can be differentiated um, between block and stream ciphers. The most common block cipher is AES, which is called uh, Advanced Encryption Standard. The most known stream cipher is RC4, which is considered to be insecure for many years already. To have a secure stream cipher nowadays, we are utilizing also AES, but with a different mode of operation. What this means in detail can be discovered on the next sessions on this channel. In a symmetric encryption network, you have the following formula to calculate the number of keys in the network itself. It is n times n minus 1 divided by 2, 
where n is pretty much just the number of participants in the network. In this session, we are not going into detail about the AES encryption algorithm and just show a brief overview of the algorithm. The algorithm will be run through in the next session in more detail. Um, AES offers three different key lengths, 128, 192, and 256-bit, which directly affects how many runs are needed to do the AES encryption. So 10 rounds for 128-bit, 12 runs for 192-bit, and 14 runs for the 256-bit key length. The block length of the plain text becoming the ciphertext at the end is always fixed to 128-bit, no matter how long the key is. AS has four different kind of operations which are used to run the algorithm. First of all, we have the operation called subbytes, where we substitute bytes. Then we have shift rows, where we, well, the name says it already, we shift the rows. And we have mixed columns, where we um, scramble up the column. And we have the add round key feature, or let's call it operation function. Um, those are run in a very fixed sequence along the different uh, runs, which you can see in the picture on the right-hand side. For AES, we're not looking into detail at RC4. Also because this algorithm is considered to be not secure for many years now, and therefore there's no much sense in going into a deep dive here. Um, this algorithm is based on a pseudo-random bit stream, which is derived by an inserted key. The encryption at the end is a simple XOR of the plain text bit and the key stream bit. This pretty much creates the stream of ciphertext bits that can be sent in a continuous stream. RC4 has no integrity protection. So if a bit is flipped accidentally or purposely, it cannot be detected by the receiver. The algorithm was hacked the first time in 2001, so already 21 years ago. Finally, IETF as a central authority forbid the use of RC4 in 2015. However, you will still find systems actually using this algorithm or accepting RC4 when ciphers are being selected between sender and receiver. In contrast to symmetric encryption and systems, we have asymmetric systems. This was invented significantly later than symmetric systems. In 1976, Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman came up with a new algorithm structure. This structure is based on two different keys, one for encryption and one another for decrypting ciphertext. The public key is, as the name already says, publicly available. This key is used to encrypt messages. On the other side, we have the private key, which always must be kept private. This key functions as the decrypting key for messages which are sent to me and were encrypted with my public key. Important to mention here is that every participant in the network uses the same encryption algorithm, such as Diffie-Hellman or RSA. And the number of keys is simple, as we have two keys per participant. Now let's run this through a high-level example. Alice wants to send a message, hello, to Bob. And therefore she grabs his public key to encrypt the message. This encrypted message is sent to Bob, who ultimately takes his own private key to decrypt the ciphertext to eventually receive the hello message from Alice. Let's run a short example on the Diffie-Hellman algorithm where we have again Alice and Bob trying to communicate with each other. In the first step, Alice and Bob need to agree on a prime number and a generator number. 
In this example, we take 13 as the prime number and 6 as the generator. Then both come with a private key for themselves. Alice wants to use 5 and Bob wants to take 4. Afterwards, they are both utilizing a fixed mathematical equation, taking the generator to the private key power and then modulo it with the prime number. In this example, Alice is taking 6 to the fifth power and modulo it with 13. So the remainder is 2. 2 now becomes the public key of Alice. Bob is doing the same with its own private key and comes up with the public key of 9. Now they exchange those public keys and use them to calculate a shared secret. Here Alice takes the public key of Bob to the private key power again and then modulo it with the prime number. Bob is doing a 2 and should come to this exact same number as Alice. In this example, 3. The 3 will be then the secret to encrypt onward communication. Closing today's session, we need to take a look into a key principle of ID security, which is Kirchhoff's principle. This principle is considered to be one of the most core fundamentals of modern security approaches. In the past, cryptographers always tried to keep the encryption algorithm uh, secret, which we call today security by obscurity. The problem with this is that once a system or the algorithm is unveiled, all messages related and sent via the algorithm are compromised on one strike, even for past sent messages. Nowadays, this approach is considered to be a no-go approach in modern analysis security. Today, cryptographers are more than happy to share the algorithm with everyone on the internet. Now you might ask yourself, but how is the message secure if everyone knows the algorithm? Well, it's about keeping the key used for the encryption and decryption safe. So we put it into like a virtual safe. And therefore we can utilize swarm intelligence from the open source community to find any kind of bugs, vulnerabilities and improvement points because many eye pairs see more than just a single pair of eyes. That's it for today's session. I hope it helped you guys with learning something new today or simply having a refresh of know-how. I hope to see you in the upcoming videos. Next up is a deeper dive into symmetric encryption. Feel free to leave comments, questions and feedback under the video and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy my content. Have a good one and stay safe.